evil stir in the minds of human beings to the point where a legend becomes a haunting and the haunting lives as truth in the hearts and minds of the people who tell it. If you're new to this channel, I am Ricky Rocket. I am the drummer for Poison, but on my spare time, I like to investigate creepy stuff and mainly urban legends. I do what's called legend tripping. So please subscribe, hit the like button if you like this video, and set your notifications so that you know when I upload new videos, as I do about once a week. There's no way to cover everything Amityville in one or two videos this length. However, most of what I'm going to concentrate on uh, is the history of the house. Of course, the murders, you can see the last episode that I did, and the alleged hauntings and the aftermath that ensued. I'm not here to debunk or promote the paranormal. I'm simply bringing forth facts, hearsay, eyewitnesses, testimony, and evidence that has been presented over the years. On December 18th, 1975, the Lutz family moved into the previously DeFeo-owned Amityville house. It was only 13 months after the DeFeo murders. The Lutzes said that DeFeo slayings weren't something that would bother them. The day before they moved in, a father, Picarero, arrived to bless the family's new home. He heard voices saying, get out. There were swarms of flies, even though it was late December. Day one, the Lutzes said that they had felt strange sensations and soon the family's personality drastically changed. Apparently, the young couple beat the kids with a strap and a wooden spoon because they were becoming brats after they moved in. Bizarre odors like the stench of bile and the smell of cheap perfume, black stains appeared on the toilets and could not be lifted even with Clorox bleach. Green slime ran down the walls. The swarms of flies continued in the dead of winter. A crucifix was turned upside down. Kathy Lutz was grabbed by unseen beings. George would wake up nightly at 3.15 a.m. That's the time it was believed that when the DeFeos were actually killed. George awoke one night to witness his wife transform into a 90-year-old hag. The next night, she began levitating off the bed forcing him to grab her before she floated away. The family asked the priest to return one more time to perform another blessing on the house. The priest had been feeling the after effects of that very first time that he had come to bless the house, apparently. The priest would not return to the house and George and Kathy decided to take it into their own hands. They got a crucifix themselves. They walked through the house reciting the Lord's Prayer and voices shouted in response asking them, Will you stop? Will you stop? The daughter, Melissa Lutz, had befriended an invisible, red-eyed pig named Jody. Jody could not be seen by anyone unless it wanted to be seen. At times, it was a little bigger than a teddy bear, and other times, bigger than the house. It went on. Forces ripped the front door off its hinges. Windows were smashed. Banisters ripped off. Damage to the garage door. Water damage from hurricane force winds. George awakened to the sound of a marching band in his living room. After 28 days, the family had had enough. They grabbed a few things and ran off to Kathy's mother's house in Babylon, Long Island to try to get away from it. George and Kathy claimed that they were haunted by evil forces right up till the time of their death. This, my legend tripping friends, is the story that the book, The Amityville Horror, has told. So what's the aftershock from all this stuff? 20 days after the Lutzes fled, demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren were called in by a Marvin Scott, who was a news reporter with Channel 5 in New York. He had covered the Amityville story and worked on an investigation prior uh, with the Warrens. A team of reporters, investigators, and parapsychologists were assembled by Ed Warren and they met at the home at 112 Ocean Avenue. The Lutz family refused to re-enter the home during the investigation. During the investigation, Ed was physically pushed to the floor while using some religious provocation in the basement. Lorraine was also overwhelmed by the sense of a demonic presence. She was plagued by her psychic impressions of the DeFeo family's bodies 
laid along the floor, covered in white sheets and a sense of physically being pushed back. The research team also captured an image of a spirit that appeared as a little boy peering from the second floor. There was a man by the name of Gene Campbell who is a professional photographer. He set up a camera with uh, infrared. He had let the camera do numerous rolls throughout the night and on that roll was that very suspicious image of the demon boy or it was a haunting of the, the younger Lutz boy looking around the corner and that has been the subject of a lot of debate for many many years. The land was also found to be used by John Ketchum. John Ketchum was a practicing magician and had a cottage on the land prior to the construct of this Dutch colonial in 1924. John requested that his remains be buried on the property and they remain there till this day, apparently. The Indians of that area uh, also had an enclosure on this land that was used to house the sick and the mad. Those in this enclosure were left there to die. The Warrens believed that that energy was such a negative energy that it left an impression that was just ripe for demonic possession or demonic infestation of anything on that property. The Warrens believed these energies directly impacted the lives of both the DeFeos and the Lutzes. The Warrens retrieved a handful of the Lutzes' earthly possessions and a deed for the property. The Lutzes sold the rest of their belongings and relocated to California. Another very famous parapsychologist who entered the house was Hans Holzer. Hans Holzer's very famous investigation in Amityville Horror transpired in January of 1977. Holzer and a spiritual medium named Ethel Johnson Myers entered 112 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, New York. Myers claimed that the house had been built over an ancient Native American burial ground. So this was the second time there was a burial ground or something to do with Native Americans on that land. The angry spirit of an Indian chief, apparently by the name of Rolling Thunder, she felt had possessed the previous occupant, Ronald DeFeo Jr., driving him to murder his entire family. Ethel Johnson Myers, by the way, was a former opera singer who became a trance medium. Essentially, she used her body to become a guide between the living and the dead. She has since passed away, but was apparently a fantastic person who helped even police with some of their very difficult missing persons cases. I was lucky enough to interview Hans Holter's daughter, Alexandra Holter, and get a closer look into her father's investigation. I found Alexandra, or Alex, to be a absolutely sweetheart of a person and was very, very generous with all her information and all the history of her father. Here is that interview that I did with her on Skype. Do you still have your mother? Yes, I do. Oh, okay. I do. Oh, yeah. Did she ever care about this stuff? Yeah, she's also an intuitive and she um, grew up with stories and, you know, her grandfather was Count Boxhoveden of Russia. So you hear that and it's like, wow, because she's related to Catherine the Great. But the way that they were raised before the war had hit and that tore everything apart was he used to hold seances in Mijano, Italy, in a castle. So she grew up with her father trying to conjure up the dead. Do you know what I mean? And then she married my father. And so he was already of the dead. You know what I mean? So uh, she always had stories and uh, experiences being touched, pushed off a bed. And so she partnered with my father and they investigated almost 15 years as husband and wife in the 60s, 70s. So yeah. are you a witch or are you Christian? Or You know, I don't know. My husband says I'm a witch. I says, which one, honey, the good or the bad? I don't know. But uh, um, I used to have faith and religion and that but um and I agree with my father in this it's it's there's when you're dealing with the paranormal the occult the unknown unexplainable and so forth it's kind of hard to have a specific faith I would say more towards the occult with being like a white witch the main thing is is that I've done I think you saw the first part the murders yeah and then, of course, now we're dealing with a paranormal end of the story. And it's a many-splendored thing because 
if you just look at just the part of it that is just George and Kathy Lutz and you stop after that, it's not quite so complicated. But if you go beyond that and then start to go into the aftermath and um, all that kind of stuff, it becomes very compl complicated. The fact of the matter is that what I happen to believe is that, and I don't know what part of it is true, there's got to be, to me, some kind of an energy at that house that has created so much chaos over time, okay? When your dad went there, did he go after Ed and Lorraine Warren or before Ed and Lorraine Warren? Yeah, I, I believe it was after. Um, I, he was there in 1977. The house was empty, and um, he went with uh, medium Ethel Johnson Mayers. That's who he had chose for that case. And, you know, basically, uh, when I was old enough to understand his work, you know, looking at it on the shelves, all these books, and, you know, you see the movie, and, you know, I asked him, I said, well, what's this one? This is out Long Island. We used to go there as kids all the time, you know, so... And he said, well, the, the, you know, I read it in the paper in the New York Times. And then somebody had contacted him and asked if he wouldn't mind doing a walkthrough and do an investigation on the house. So he said, OK, like any other case. And uh, he chose Ethel. And she didn't know anything about the case. This is pre-internet, pre-everything. And so, you know, he'd always make sure that they don't know as much as possible. And they went out to Long Island and that's where they did the investigation and where Ethel felt the uh, Native American Indian spirit come through and how the possession theory was brought to light and so forth. So. All right. So my question is, okay, is there, is it haunted? Are there ghosts or is it is it demon yeah. infestation or go or a poltergeist or, or, or is it caught in a, um, what a loop, a, you know, I forget the pr proper term for it because Ed and Lorraine Warren are demonologists. They're not parapsychologists, right? Correct. Correct. Is it a matter of the devil or is it a matter of ghost? Well, here's the thing. Um, when it began, when my father became involved, he always said that the house itself wasn't haunted and that the original location of where the house is now was not where the house was. So there was a, there was nothing in that place, you know, back, I believe, in the late 1700s, early 1800s, all farmland. And then they started, you know, putting up the houses. And he said that they moved the house to this plot, which is where it resides on Ocean Avenue and that the land itself had negative energy and that there were reported fires at the barns would uh, burn down, um, children being afraid to, to go across the fields, you know. So when he did his history and research, he found out that this was really based on the property, which can also harbor a haunting, you know, not the structure itself. Now you put the structure there and then you have murders take place. That's, you know, prime spot for a grade A haunting. There's there's three ways of looking at this. And I don't know what your belief system is, but you know, so if, if you you don't have to be religious to believe in ghosts, okay? But you have to be religious to believe in demons. Uh, at least you have to acknowledge all, all that, that whole hierarchy, okay? And then um, of course you can also go with the theory that Amityville House is now haunted. Because nobody can ever go there without the stigma of everything that happened. So forever, it's going to echo all the things that have happened there. You know what I'm saying? Whether we like it or not, whether we think it's spiritual or not, whether we think it's demon-like or not. But what I'm trying to get at is if demons have the knowledge that spans the ages and they mock a ghost— how do you know if it's a ghost or if it's a demon? You don't because that's the question at hand. Mm. You know, part of doing the investigations is jumping ahead and thinking it's a haunting, it's a ghost. Even if it's a poltergeist, which is, you know, creating negative energy in the environment. Demons, you would think, disguise themselves. And we can get into, you know... Uh, kind of like morphing of an, a creature then becomes a human kind of thing. So a demon might come off like a ghost where they're just 
you know, in a different atmosphere, they're looking for help, they're stuck, they want to leave, they don't know how to leave, they just want to communicate. Demons are not are about the same thing. It's a negative energy. And I know my father always said, you know, he didn't believe in heaven or hell. There's kind of like, there's a place that we all go and it's different tiers. So the worse off you are on, in this world, the lower you go. But if you're not of this world, and I used to ask him that, and he said, of course, everything's possible. So what is a demon? Ghosts are, are you know, our inner shell without the physical. What constitutes a demon? So I, I think it's a possibility there. All right. So back to Amityville for a second. So, um, so there's been allegations that there was not an Indian burial ground right there. So what you're saying is, is that the house was moved. Um, uh, the, the water table was too low and there was no way they would have buried anybody there and all that kind of stuff. You know, the Indians said there wasn't. I mean, it's not like they wrote this stuff down. So well, yeah, well, like who was really counting if the bodies went in or out? Like, you know, uh, no, well, you know, it's it's also possibly protecting their people and not wanting to have that connection to that. But it, my father had interviewed, um, I believe it was one of the historians, and we have it on film, which I could show you later, where um, the guy, you know, was talking to my father with the files and. You know, he goes, I don't believe there was a burial ground there. And this is why. And my father said, but look at the evidence and what we have. I said, do you discount the possibility that there was? And he goes, I don't discount that as well. So he couldn't say yes or no to it. So what about John Ketchum? Is that completely fabricated? I don't know. I don't. It's, this is, um, I'm not sure. I mean, in Salem, there is a statue of John Ketchum. In the middle, yeah. of, by the way. Yeah. Um, so he was pretty highly regarded. Now, maybe the witches don't want that connection. That's what I'm thinking. You know, it's um, I would think that would be the case because, yeah, there's, you know, the town of Amityville, you know, has the witch building and then it has in the cemetery a lot of mysterious people dying. And these were like, you know, financiers and so forth. Maybe a doctor was in there as well, but they were murdered. And there's this whole thing about the graveyard. And I thought that was, it's just interesting how that's all connected in there. As a legend tripper, okay, you know, I try not to discount anything or force anything one way or the other. I mean, that's my, to me, that's my job. My job is to expose myself to it, to see what, what could or could be, you know what I mean? I try not to prejudge a, a situation, you know, Agreed. I, from a standpoint, um, of uh, from a paranormal standpoint, do you believe that Ronald DeFeo was influenced by something? Um, well, that was what my father believed through Ethel. And uh, the both times that DeFeo went was in prison, my father was allowed access to the both spots. He ended up where he is now still today. Um, and he was convinced then that, you know, Ronnie was possessed, but, you know, digging deeper into the character of Ronnie and who he was as his background, you know, my father wasn't a crime investigator. His job was to, you know, do what he did, you know, head right. ghost hunter there, you know, and, and spiritualism and things. So he wouldn't look for all that, that, you know, an, an investigator for, you know, the police would be doing. He had a CD background. He had a way about him. You know, locals would tell their stories. And so you start to put this together and then he's in prison telling my dad, I, I don't I don't know what happened. I don't remember. You know, one minute I'm here, the next minute I'm doing this. You know, he told me to do it. My father just, you know, found, you know, as disgusting as it was that he believed generally that he was taken over by the angry Indian chief spirit. And there's that culture, too. And I believe in curses. I certainly wouldn't go into a mummy's tomb and take the treasure and run. Do you know what I mean? I don't think so. Well, so nobody else so far that's lived in that house has reported anything. I wonder why that is. Yeah. Well, my father didn't think it was haunted. You know, he felt that, you know, that if there was any problems that somebody would call clearly or you would see the house being sold quite a bit. 
Uh, he's not here today to answer to that, but I think that it is interesting. It seems to always be back on the market. It's, I mean, you've, you know, been out to Long Island. I mean, Long Island's beautiful. People were set in there to bless the house, to exercise it, to get rid of the the evil, to get rid of the, the, the bad energy. So, I mean, maybe that bad energy is gone, and that's why nobody else has been bothered, you know? Maybe not. Absolutely. And I believe in that as well. I think you can have a clearing and it moves on. You know, it's like if you have a haunted castle that's thousands of years old and it's still haunted, what are the odds of that really? Maybe it's another layer of specters that you're dealing with, or maybe it's an, it's somebody from a different planet coming in or ESP and telepathy to fool you. You, there's a, you really don't know. But age is, it moves on. Like you said, energy is always moving. So you can't really haunt one place forever. You just really can't you know it just doesn't make sense it's going to dissipate or move on or just something else will come through not what i would could say an intelligent haunting an intelligent haunting is where i see you and you see me you know um but this is more of a, a residual haunting where the person would be let's say at 12 o'clock every day goes up the stairs to their office and closes the door and you're the new homeowner and at that same time every day this is what you're witnessing by sound. But they they who have lived in that house and passed there don't notice you, the new homeowner. They're just in a loop because they haven't been able to move out and onward to where they need to be. They're stuck in a memory of what was once their home. It's right. very sad. So I guess bottom line, is the Amityville house the most haunted house in America? What do you think? I think... It is because publicly it became known to be and there was so much media on it. I would say, um, realistically, if there wasn't all that attention on it, I would say no. Because there's been other har uh, horrible mass, mass murders in other places, which much more loss of souls. And I would say, well, wouldn't that be the most haunted? You know, I, mean, I think the more, sa sadly, the more death in one concentrated area, which is why they do investigations in asylums, for instance, and right. the death that went on there. And the, you know, so I think because of the publicity and the, the books, dad included, but you know, his was really about the investigation, not about fame. He didn't care. Trust me, you should see how he dressed. He didn't care about none of that. So lastly, let's talk about your show. So you, did you film everything so far? Yeah, no, uh, everything was filmed. Um, we got a, a season one order, so we were really excited about that. And it's basically bringing back a lot of stuff with the Holzers, you know, and it's called the Holzer Files for that purpose, you know. So that's really the star of the show is the files and, you know, my father's work. And um, so they're basing it around that. So everything is set. It's going to air um, October 3rd which is Thursday at 10 o'clock on the Travel Channel. Several of the photos that were taken at the scene uh, had very weird anomalies, which appeared to be the supposed images of bullet marks made in the original 1974 murders. So no one has been able to confirm or deny the burial of an Indian chief on Ocean Avenue in Amityville. Holter went on to write several books about the Amityville house. Here's the fallout. After telling their story, George and Kathy took a lie detector test to prove their innocence. They passed. The couple were bogged down by legal and financial issues, and skeptics believed that they had moved to create a fantastical story to sell to the public. The Lutz's former lawyer, William Weber, who fell out, had a fallout with them over money issues, came out in 1979 claiming that the three of them came up with this whole story over several bottles of wine. Now, it is definitely possible that this guy was trying to discredit them because he wanted to hurt them because he was emblazoned in a legal battle. The son, Daniel Lutz, who lives a quiet life in Queens, New York, as a stonemason, claims that the house ruined his life, that the Amityville haunting was real and he blames it largely on his stepfather, George. He couldn't stand him, and he also knew that George had dabbled in the occult, and he was capable of supposedly telekinesis. Daniel also claims that he himself was possessed by a spirit, just like the exorcist, complete with a violently shaking bed. He claims that he has horrible nightmares to this day. 
Christopher finally decided to speak up, that was the younger brother, and he claimed that most of the details in the original book and movie were made up. Uh, he offered a completely different perspective on it, where George's tampering with the occult was the thing to blame for the haunting. Murderer Ron DeFeo, who's still alive and serving six 25-year life sentences in a New York correctional facility, claimed that he heard voices urging him to kill his family. He has since changed his story multiple times. Now, they also talked about how Dawn, the sister, could have been involved, and that she had a black house coat on that night, and uh, it was cold, so she had her hood up over, and she walked and handed him the gun, and he was messed up on drugs, so he may have thought it was this black force landing on the gun. This is all conjecture, but there are some people, like his defense attorney, really believed this story. In 1979, there was an interview with the real priest that went to Amityville, and that was on a show called In Search Of, and on that show, he talked about, he said that there was constant phone interference and he could never get through to warn the family. Kathy's aunt was formerly a nun. When Ed and Lorraine Warren were doing their investigation, there was a man by the name of Gene Campbell, who's a professional photographer. He set up a camera with uh, infrared, the real George Lutz admitted that as of 2005, he had been involved in no less than 14 Amityville-related lawsuits. Attorney William Weber came forward and said that he had gotten together with George and Kathy Lutz one night and they had come up with a story over many bottles of wine. However, the impact of Weber's relation was short-lived when it was discovered that he was emblazoned in his own legal battle with the Lutzes at the time and may have had a motive to purposely discredit their story. So in conclusion, is the Amityville house haunted? Absolutely, I believe that it is. I believe that there is a negative energy there, but I'm not gonna blame it on the Indians or the burial ground. I'm not sure what it is or why it happened or why it was there, or maybe it's gone. Because the fact of the matter is that there's been so many paranormal investigators, so many healers, so many people of faith that have gone to Amityville to try to get rid of the evil. So maybe the evil's gone. I know that the last time that I went there, a couple of years ago, I walked around the front of the house. I took pictures. I walked around the back of the house. I got as close to the house as I could without bothering the people that lived there. And I did not feel anything negative. So I do believe that whatever was there is not there anymore. But it is haunted with the notion that forever, forever, People will always associate it with the murders and they will associate it with the hauntings. Every Halloween, people are going to visit the Amityville house. And if you do, please be respectful of the occupants. It's a very nice town and the people are very nice. Please respect them. This is a phenomenal story and uh, it will continue to live on in the hearts and minds of anybody that ever does visit 112 Ocean Avenue. Take care of each other and keep rock alive. Later in the week, I'm going to upload some bonus footage uh, from the interview, sort of a conversation that I had with Alexandra Holzer. And uh, that's going to be available on my Patreon channel, which is patreon.com slash Ricky Rocket. So please come and check that out. <laughs>